All right. So uh, it's really a pleasure to continue the day today. I think we've had a great conversation this morning uh, around the focus on older adults. And now we're going to take a step back and we're going to talk a bit more about care partners. Uh, I'm really pleased to have my co-organizer, Beth Minot from Georgia Tech, uh, to lead this panel. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Beth to kick it off and uh, get things rolling. Beth. Good morning. Again, my name is Beth Minot. I'm from uh, Georgia Tech. I run our Institute for People and Technology. And I'm very excited about the panel today because my absolute first project in this space uh, 20 years ago? Don't look at me. Well, because Wendy was my collaborator, so she's organized about how long, was focused on the needs of family caregivers uh, for, older, for their parents uh, in a uh, the aspiration of helping them age in place. And so I, I learned very early on that as you look at the complexity of engineering for an aging society, that the role of caregivers, the complexity, the demand, uh, the unpaid compensation, reimbursement, uh, even kind of the, the stress uh, on the caregivers themselves is incredibly important for us to understand a holistic uh, strategy uh, towards bending the curve or changing uh, the experience of aging in our country and others. So uh, we have three terrific experts, uh, and if you were here in the first session this morning, you know the you know the format. But each of them will give a brief 10 minute or so presentation, and then we'll all gather together at the stage to take uh, questions and answers. So please write down your notes and questions. And speaking of notes, I'm glad to see we have some post-it notes. So you've got those notes as you had those aha moments or those things that you want to make sure we continue to pay attention to throughout the symposium, please jot those down and we'll keep adding them to that set. So um, my first presenter is Jennifer Wolf. She is the Eugene and Mildred Lippitz Professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management. And she's also the director of the Roger C. Lippitz Center for Integrated Healthcare at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. She also holds a joint appointment in the Division of Geriatric medicine and gerontology here at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. And her research, uh, as you can guess, given my introduction, really focuses on that complexity of the caregiver needs, especially for older persons with complex health needs and disabilities, and how do you manage that support care network. So we're excited to have Jennifer join us this morning. I'm looking at that to do the Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I am a health services researcher, and uh, for my talk, I'll be focusing on challenges and opportunities of um, supporting family caregivers within systems of care delivery. So in thinking about retooling or re-engineering for an aging society, it's um, I'm so pleased that you have a session on supporting uh, care partners or family caregivers of older adults, uh, given the important role that they play as the backbone of the long-term services and supports workforce, and, off, and too often um, tasked with filling in gaps in the fragmented care delivery system. Um, it's important to contrast the professional work, healthcare workforce who's well-educated and credentialed to function within a clearly defined scope of practice with family caregivers or, or care partners who are thrust into their role without any formal education or preparation and provide a wide variety of care across the, um, the entire care delivery spectrum following patients um, across settings from hospital to post-acute care back into the community, uh, providing help with um, a complex set of self-care activities, household activities, um, and increasingly complex medical and nursing tasks. Despite the uh, fact that most uh, healthcare professionals and the direct care workforce are enormously committed to supporting individual patients and families, 
It's important to recognize there are a number of structural challenges to support of family caregivers within systems of care. Uh, for example, coverage decisions for reimbursable services are predicated on an individual's insurance coverage and don't compensate providers for additional time spent educating, counseling, or supporting family caregivers who are often um, involved in, in the care of patients with the most complex health care um, uh, needs. Likewise, the prevailing orientation um, appropriately emphasizes uh, the privacy of, of patients' health information and patient autonomy. Um, however, uh, these systems often presented a barrier to the provision of information that is appropriate and necessary when families are tasked with supporting patients who lack the capacity to manage health on their own. Likewise, patient-oriented information systems uh, uh, often ask about the availability of help to bridge gaps in function um, uh, in, to enact the treatment plan. Um, however, information about family caregivers who are involved in, in enacting the care plan uh, typically don't require direct communication with the family member. So therefore, the information is um, of questionable veracity. Um, and the challenge is that because families fall outside the formal re regulatory, legal, and financial arrangements, they're largely invisible in systems of, of care. So this is a schematic from a New England Journal of Medicine perspective um, that was published several years ago that reflects the current care delivery paradigm for individuals with complex health needs, focusing on interactions here that are presented um, during just one 80-day episode between a single primary care uh, provider and a patient. Um, that involves uh, interactions with 12 different clinicians um, and uh, five procedures, it's 60 contacts, uh, something like 11 office visits, largely by phone and by email. And the figure was meant to depict the complexity and hard work of care coordination by individual clinicians and patients. I and mean, I want to draw to your attention to the fact that the patient's wife who's mentioned in the article as being the caregiver is notably absent from the schematic. And a challenge is that the reliance on patient-oriented systems leaves family caregivers invisible without information collected about which patients rely on a caregiver, who the caregiver is, uh, as well as the caregiver's capacity to provide care. And so a challenge is that without surveillance, it's difficult to fully understand the contributions of family caregivers um, that are making across the system of care. Um, and having uh, such information would allow, in, um, enable, better enable the development and evaluation of interventions that harness this resource in ways that are beneficial to patients, to family caregivers, as well as to um, values uh, that are of value to care delivery stakeholders. So a lot of my work has focused on uh, strategies to better support patients with cognitive impairment and their families. Um, this quote from the wife of a patient with cognitive impairment um, speaks to her challenges in interacting with a primary care provider. She says, clinicians get angry with me and they're like, let them speak, as if this is a picnic for me, which it's not. And I think this quote um, speaks to some of the challenges of the lack of, an, of a coherent role for families within systems of care. And these present a number of challenges in that they too often place families in an adversarial role in terms of um, advocating for additional services and supports to, patient, to uh, support the patient, having a voice in the decisions about care, or being able to access information that the family needs to be able to provide appropriate care in the community or coordinate care um, with other clinicians who may be involved. So these are just some quotes from uh, pa patients and family participants from a recent study that speak to some of the, um, the important role that care partners or caregivers play in the care of individuals who have memory impairment. Um, the bottom quote uh, reads, uh, we live together, I'm involved in all her activities, I retired for this purpose. Every, doc every doctor we go to, I'm the backbone. When we go into the doctor's office, I wait and see. If she answers incorrectly, I step in. I've grown into where I am with her now. 
So beyond um, uh, serving as a knowledgeable informant and um, in being involved in communication, families play an important role in the community in ensuring safety and autonomy in daily activities, managing medications, um, helping with driving, uh, helping with self-care and, and household activities, as well as um, managing issues such as wandering, problem behaviors, and falls. Um, in a recent paper, um, my colleagues and I drew on national data and examined caregivers who were helping with two prevalent and clinically important health management activities. And we um, looked at caregivers who were helping with both care coordination and managing medications, um, which we defined as substantial health care help. And we found that um, of about 15 million family and other unpaid caregivers of older adults living in the community, about six and a half million were providing substantial health care help. We found that these uh, caregivers were providing significantly more hours of care than caregivers who were not providing substantial health care help. Just one in four were using respite care, receiving a, uh, uh, participating in a support group, or received education or training from health professionals about the role that they were playing in managing care. Um, we found um, that caregivers who provided substantial health care help, shown in dark blue, were about twice as likely to experience emotional difficulty, physical difficulty, or financial difficulty due to their caregiving role. We found they were uh, more than five times as likely to experience participation impacts in the form of reduced participation in valued activities that were important to them, such as uh, visiting with families and friends or attending religious services. We found that rates of employment did not differ, but that caregivers who are providing substantial health care help were three times more likely to experience um, work, uh, work productivity loss um, for those who are employed. And this is important because um, this study establishes that the hard work of managing complex care extends beyond patients and clinicians to families, and that the care delivery system is well poised to be able to identify families who could benefit from additional services and supports. So I'm going to shift gears now and talk a little bit about strategies um, to better support families in care delivery. Um, so it's important to uh, recognize that um, a, a, big, a big challenge in this area in, in thinking about how to devise strategies to better support families is that um, what families need is highly variable. There's a lot of heterogeneity based on the caregiving circumstances, but that what they need encompasses pretty much all dimensions of family life, um, including information, knowledge, and, and re uh, resources, respite care, uh, reinforcement in the form of referrals um, or support from others, uh, skills and counseling to help with coping to manage emotional impacts, financial support to offset work impacts or out-of-pocket spending related to provision of care, and flexibility in the workplace. Um, if we think about this, these, these issues are similar to um, other types of caregiving across the lifespan, including, for example, um, uh, individuals who are new parents. But there are also important differences in that um, the trajectory and scope of late life caregiving is much more variable, um, uncertain, and often uh, can be long lasting. Uh, I wanted to just speak briefly to the types of supports that now exist, um, and these are relatively modest. Um, the Administration for Community Living um, the, uh, is the largest national program that is broadly available, available to provide supports and services for family caregivers of older adults, and it's funded at about $150 million a year. Um, there are other important services that, uh, and supports that are available, however, these are limited to particular populations such as caregivers of individuals who are veterans or who are insured uh, through the Medicaid program. I was a member of the National Academies of Medicine Consensus Committee that drafted the report, uh, the 2016 report, Families Caring for an Aging America, where one of the overarching recommendations was the need to shift care delivery from patient-centered or person-centered care 
towards person and family-centered care. And that report is an, is an important place to look because it presents a roadmap of a research and policy agenda around how to shift systems of care towards uh, family-centered care, including issues related to systematically identifying families within, within care processes, um, understanding the family perspective, um, both in quality reporting as well as through, for example, family-generated health information as we um, advance in um, the electronic health record, um, as well as shifting interprofessional team-based care to include the role of the family. Um, and then this is my last slide. I just, uh, in terms of thinking uh, more broadly about approaches to better support family caregivers um, in the home and the community as well as in systems of care, uh, as Sarah mentioned earlier, the uh, strategies to uh, better support aging in place um, and accommodate disability includes both increasing capacity and reducing demand. So strategies to improve capacity could be strategies that um, focus on both the patient, the person who's living with disability as, the family, as well as the family caregiver. This could include tailored training to the particular circumstances um, and, and uh, disease processes that are causing the chronic and disabling condition, um, using multiple different modes and delivery strategies as well as um, uh, strategies that reduce caregiving um, demand by both increasing capacity of the older adult, um, as well as supplementing services and supports um, through, for example, at, um, attendance services. And, and as Sarah mentioned, really the, the opportunities here are, are almost en endless. And I'll end here, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. That was terrific. I was typing as many notes as quickly as I could. Um, a lot to learn from there. So um, our next speaker is Ken Hebert. Uh, he is a gerontologist. He is uh, from, from my hood of town because uh, he's at Emory University. And he's a professor at the Nell Hodgins School of Nursing. And he's one of the directors of Emory's Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And he's been working in this space for the past 35 years with a real uh, multi-interdisciplinary approach to uh, create and design materials to improve the capacity of individuals to care for family members and friends uh, who are living with Alzheimer's or similar diseases. And in particular, he one of his most well-known programs is called the Savvy Caregiver. Um, and he's currently uh, leading a study funded by NIA uh, to look at a sponsored trial of this Telesavvy Caregiver, which is a fully online version. So thrilled to have Ken here with us. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thanks very much. Um, the, the only app I have is a timer, so. Um, I think what Jennifer and I are doing is providing a kind of an outside, inside view <clears throat> of family caregiving for persons living with dementing disorders like Alzheimer's. How many of you have family members or no friends with family members who have Alzheimer's or dementia? Right, take a look. So half or more of people in this room are touched in one way or another by that. I want to focus on what the day is like for a person um, who is a caregiver. And I want, to, I want to focus your attention on what you can do because what that person needs to know is what can my person do today? And then the next thing she needs to know, because 75% of caregivers are women, is what is he going to be able to do tomorrow? So if you think about how we all got here, all the planning, decision-making, logistics, deciding what to wear, uh, knowing how to behave, how to interact. That's stuff we all take for granted. You know how to do that because we're functioning in an ordinary way. We're functioning in a way that is not affected by a neurocognitive illness. But as a person becomes affected by such an illness, those capacities diminish, and they diminish in unpredictable and heterogeneous ways. K 
caregiver who's used to this person. My wife and I have been married 40 years. So we've got 40 years of knowing what, my knowing, what when she raises an eyebrow means. <laughs> All right? If I become demented, every day, moment to moment, she's got to figure out which inflection works for me and what my body language means to her. And that's moving target every day. Now why is that important? Well, it's important because the really main role of a family caregiver is to provide guidance for days that are as calm, safe, and pleasant as possible. And in order to do that, you kind of have to know what's he got today? What can I count on? So that's this rely supply. What can I rely on? What do I have to supply? And that's what I'm asking you to design. We got seven million people who have these illnesses, five and almost six million with Alzheimer's, another million and a half with others. By 2050, there'll be 15, 16 million. We have 15 million caregivers. That's six times the size of the nursing workforce in, the, in this country. So as Jennifer said, this is a massive workforce that needs to be equipped and needs to be trained. Um, our principles are that the person's there. It's he or she cannot necessarily express that personhood effectively. And the caregiver has to figure out ways to get to it. So I've already mentioned this modest goal of safe, calm, pleasant days. And the principle that we teach in the savvy caregiver and telesavvy <clears throat> is that what indicates a good day is that the caregiver can look back and say she was contentedly involved or engaged throughout the day. Whether it's that great example of the architect or the, my favorite example, having moved to the South to this, you know, the, the strongest religion in the South is football. And, and, and so this caregiver places her husband in front of a TV several times a week. He's a graduate of one of these citadels. And, and she puts a videotape of his alma mater trouncing the arch rival in football. <laughs> Two hours of content and involvement, he comes out really, just really happy. Without that sort of content and involvement, one runs the risk of under or over stimulation, which can produce um, sort of discomfort and, and, and outbursts so the major problem that drives morbidity uh, uh, for um, caregivers are behavioral and psychological symptoms, outbursts, if you will, or withdrawal. How to prevent that is to try to get the person contentedly involved in a task. This is one of the big things we teach. We have a 12-hour training program for caregivers. And we do that in person or we do it online. But this is a group that needs training for a clinical role. This is one of the main things we teach. To get someone contentedly involved, understand her likes or dislikes, pick out the tackle box, get out the drafting materials, put on the football game. But you also have to know how to structure these things. You've got to know where the person is today and in general in the course of her or his progressive illness. And then know how to provide support that fits with where that person is. We teach about behavior that no matter where one is in, in a dementing disorder, um, the, the equations, the, the components of the equation remain the same, person, other, structure. But the weight of the elements changes. And so gradually, the caregiver has to learn how to take more and more control of the situation. We, we teach that performance, getting dressed, 
uh, is, a, is an active performance. You, you have to remember the purpose of it. You have to know how to put things on in order. You have to be able to button and zip and cinch. Those things are lost progressively, somewhat in order, over the course of the 8 to 12 years of a dementing disease, and also depending on whether the person has the flu or slept well last night or liked what he had for breakfast. And the caregiver has to fit with all that. Here's a simple table we provide. So if somebody is at a various stages in the illness, right, then maybe the caregiver can think, I can create a task that has four steps or three steps or maybe it's a passive involvement. And maybe it should be a task that it says, go out to the garage and get this. Or maybe it's a task that I set up a table against the blank wall and have the person just focusing on doing the tackle box kind of exercise. So you can see the range of, this is an occupational therapy, you know, task to it at its core. So, how can the caregiver know where the person is on those stages? You can know broadly. We can give people instructions and videos and say, this is what a person in early middle stage looks like and is able to do. But that's not Monday the 19th of November you know, 11.30 in the morning. I need to know what can I give him to do. So, so build something for that, would you? <laughs> um, allow the person to know how, sort of where the person's abilities are. So maybe there are ways of assessing performance capacity using a variety of te technologies. Maybe there's a way of knowing a person's stress uh, level. We're, we're, I'm working with a colleague who's working with a colleague at Georgia Tech at building just a wearable to put on a person with uh, Alzheimer's to see if her stress level is decreased in certain kinds of involvements. Well, imagine being able to know, oh, he's kind of getting close to an edge, I better back him down, or he's kind of in a really good spot, let me see if I can give him something a little bit more challenging today. So knowing that sense of capacity, and then being able to, let's see if I got this one too, being able to have a menu available, I'm proud of knowing what an Alexa is, to, um, having a menu for the day that's tailored to where the person is, okay? So then the caregiver doesn't have to kind of keep lists in a repertoire, but can kind of go and be coached, to use Jennifer's word. Today might be a good day to do this and this. Okay. So what tasks and activities would be good? At what pace, in what space, with what guidance? So no, not these long sentences with semicolons but a, a touch, a guiding touch, uh, putting a hand on something. Maybe that's what's needed today, or maybe today words will work. I'm not suggesting this is a disease that has tremendous ups and downs. What I'm saying is it has nuanced changes. And think about 12 years of days trying to adjust as a caregiver each day to those nuanced changes. If you can relieve that, that's me, if you can relieve that, you're going to enhance the capacity of this remarkable workforce. Um, so that's mostly what I want to say. I think there should be a way, based on that sort of technology, to be able to say to the caregiver, you know, next couple of, just based on trajectory over the last year, six months, Things are going to remain somewhat stable, or it looks like there may be a downturn happening. There's not going to be an upturn, I can tell you. Um, and that begins to prepare her for other kinds of things. So I think you can do remarkable things by really creating a highly sensitive assessment 
of a person's capacity and making that available to a caregiver in language she or he can understand. So, thank you. That was terrific, and um, I love this notion. I think we're going to continue this into our lunch uh, discussions as well, but being able to situate ourselves into these different roles. I think Sarah set us up really well even this morning about there is no one stereotype. The variety is incredibly important, and that, that, that then comes into kind of the variety of challenges that our, our caregivers are going to be working with. So our last professor is Catherine Ornstein. She's an epidemiologist and assistant professor at the Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine. Um, and she's at the Institute for Translational Epidemiology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And there she serves as the director of research and her for care innovations at home. And her research is funded by the National Institute of Aging, Palliative Care Research Center, and again, she's focused on the role of caregivers, uh, especially looking through the course of very serious illness um, up through end of life. So I think she's going to bring a, another unique angle and way for us to think about the complexity, the challenges we're working with. So, thank you, Kathy. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I want to especially thank my colleagues for making this easy. Um, by being the last speaker on this panel on caregiving, I think at this point you really recognize how important this area is. Um, I want to actually focus on really thinking about healthcare as something that we, we actually have to think about beyond the individual. It sort of doesn't really, really to kind of shake the whole thing up and that we can't just look at an individual when we're thinking about our healthcare system. And I want to especially focus on home-based care delivery as really an example, as, as a way, as a direction. We're certainly moving in at Mount Sinai. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Okay. So again, this is the report that Jennifer mentioned earlier, and everyone should take a look at it. There's a good executive summary if you don't have too much time. But really, this, this really reminds us that we have to move to a family-centered care focus, and that this isn't just sort of something we need to do in healthcare. This is actually a, a public health concern. And I want to start this in thinking about we have a long-standing research uh, for, uh, that, that actually shows why individuals are impacted by their loved ones. And I think an example that everyone knows is what we think of as the widowhood effect or dying of a broken heart, which is that we know that individuals are imp impacted by the experience of their loved one dying. Uh, we see evidence of this. I don't know if every, anyone knows who that is on the, on the left, those two. Yes? Um, Johnny Cash? And, um, that's right, that's right. Um, and now don't worry, George Bush is, uh, did not die that I've heard, I've, I've been traveling a lot. But, but, what I, but I bring that up because after uh, Barbara Bush was, um, w after she died, he was hospitalized. And there was a, so, so this effect is not just dying necessarily, it sort of impacts um, people's lives. And I would also say, I, I, don't, I don't think these two need any introduction, but anyway. Um, my students always only know uh, Carrie Fisher. Um, but anyway, uh, I bring these two up because these aren't just, this isn't a spousal dyad, right? So here's an example of a daughter dying and a mother dying just a few days later. So we certainly see evidence of this. We know this. We see it in science and we sort of see it in life and, of course, pop culture. We've studied this a little bit more to really think about how the healthcare experience could ultimately impact families. And I think a good example of this is uh, hospice care. And we sort of recognize, for those of you who may have experienced personally or with your patients, that we can see really some positive benefits for the hospice experience for families. And of course, on the other side, we actually have done research to see uh, more negative impacts for families uh, relative, uh, uh, related to uh, more treatment intensive situations that families uh, are impacted by. And I would say we've, we've now looked to see this a step further, we're saying if, if we can actually understand how uh, the health, ex the healthcare experience of one individual impacts um, outcomes and health outcomes and mental health outcomes for an individual, we could actually look at healthcare costs for their family as well. So you know, we spend a lot of time in caregiving research, especially thinking about uh, spillover effects or downstream effects, specifically around lost wages and sort of care loss because we're caring for loved ones. 
And I'd say we can actually take this a step further and even think, think about downstream healthcare costs related to that experience. And I would say that while we think of caregiving throughout the course of illness, we also need to think about it in the end of life period, especially, um, as well as after someone dies, sort of, there's sort of a lasting impact of that experience. So we really need to think of it beyond that. And in our own research, we've actually recently looked at this and just, I don't know, I've lost my pointer, but the line on the top, the blue line on the top is really showing increased costs for those who have a non-hospital death. And past the red line, you can actually see really can't find that, that it's actually beyond um, the point of death. So we see this two years later, that their spending is, is increased um, after their loved ones die. But I would want to say that there's some important things you have to think about in caregiving research. And one of those things is that we're not just talking about spouses. And this is work we did looking at just sort of using a national data set to say who was actually caring for individuals at the end of life. And in fact, what we found is 14% are spouses, and that means we're, con we're seeing more and more involvement from daughters, sons, other family members, non-relatives involved in this care. And I think this is really important. We often overlook this. We sometimes limit our work. I'm totally guilty of it to dyads, and that's not the case. Um, and I'd also say, as a caregiving researcher, we actually have to think about individuals who don't necessarily have family members involved. They don't have any living family necessarily. And this is work that we do in Denmark um, to actually look at this, where we look at population registers, because you can actually see who has family at any point. And in fact, we find that 21% of individuals have no living family members at the time they die. And this issue of sort of uh, kinlessness, sometimes people think of it, is actually a real, real issue um, that we have to think about. And we've looked at it, you can think about it in different diseases, dementia, in um, particular, as people have dementia, more and more uh, we're seeing that they have no family, especially as they're uh, getting older, living with the disease. This, of course, uh, as you might suspect, is impacting uh, women more in this situation. And certainly from the clinical perspective, as we think about who's uh, making end-of-life decisions, who we need to talk to about things, we have to really consider this as well. So I really want to move this idea into the context of home-based care delivery. This is a patient from the Mount Sinai Visiting Doctors Program, which is a home-based primary care program that's um, been around for about 20 years. And they um, have been around providing um, physician and nurse practitioner-led visits with social work, nursing um, support uh, for quite a long time, really struggling to keep keep up for many years in terms of what they were doing. Because, and you know, at the time they started, people thought, why would anyone go into the home to take care of patients? That's, you know, that was a long time ago. What, and, and more importantly, well, who's funding that? Why would we do that? That's crazy. Um, and indeed, it really was at the time. Um, but in fact, I'll show you, um, Mount Sinai has really kind of built a whole initiative around um, home-based services at this point. So I'm excited to say the program still exists and is thriving. In the work around um, the homebound population, we actually used a national survey to identify two million uh, older adults who are indeed homebound, meaning they rarely or never leave the home. Now what's so important about this is that's actually larger than the current nursing home population in this country. Um, but what's even more interesting I find about this is the people who, they're not technically homebound, they're going out, but they're only going out because they never can go out by themselves. They're only going out because someone's there for them. So they could be homebound, meaning they could not leave the home, therefore have, have a tremendous difficulty accessing just primary care as well as other services and as well as things that are important to their quality of life. And as you can imagine, uh, you can see becoming homebound then is not just about individuals' multimorbidity, functional impairment, cognitive impairment, but in fact their social support and their network of family caregivers becomes really important to understanding the difference between, between being homebound and getting out. Again, accessing basic primary care. And in fact, we find that there's five million caregivers assisting the homebound. Um, and importantly, individuals who are, real, who are homebound, they are not leaving the house, most of them do not have any paid care 
at all. So that means that they really are highly reliant on families. So I want to tell you a little bit about Mount Sinai at Home, which is launched uh, this past year, um, which is really an initiative that the hospital is undertaking with the idea of uh, recognizing that we are, they're really investing in home-based services. And it's really, I think of it as a comprehensive portfolio um, spanning primary care, moving through uh, urgent care, acute care, as well as post-acute care. And I, I don't think I have a slide of it here, but sort of Mount Sinai has moved in this direction with their kind of now famous um, uh, ad about, you know, if our beds are filled, that means we've failed. So it's sort of moving in that direction. Um, so in terms of primary care, we have a home-based primary care program. We're now expanding that to community-based palliative care as well um, in terms of providing urgent home visits. And then we're also in the urgent care spectrum partnering with uh, community paramedic programs. And here we're using a lot of technology for physicians to sort of lead the service where the community paramedics are making um, home visits and uh, uh, facilitating virtual visits with physicians. And we've actually been using this for a while within our home-based primary care program because an important component of home-based primary care is to really provide 24-hour access to care. Um, and exciting, um, at Mount Sinai for the past four years, we've had a hospital at home program which um, the uh, idea really came from Hopkins. Um, we've um, been able to develop it with colleagues here. And that came from a, a CMMI innovation grant, but now we're really trying to make this a real permanent part of our infrastructure. Um, and with that, we provide um, uh, hospital-based services in the home for individuals with a range of diagnoses, as well as now a rehab at home program. So we're seeing a lot of benefits to home-based care, um, including uh, reduced rate of rehospitalization, um, uh, reduced rate of adverse events, including falls. We're really doing a lot of work now thinking about the cost effectiveness of these programs because honestly, that's going to allow us to continue our dissemination efforts. Um, but really looking at um, specific work around functional mobility with the idea that by letting people recuperate more in their homes, that's actually how they will do better, and we're less likely to see sort of um, more uh, negative outcomes such as delirium for, for, for older adults. But I want to sort of bring this back to caregivers, because I think really as we're thinking about this expansion of home-based care yeah. delivery, we have to stop and ask ourselves, well, what about the families? How, how, how do they help us make this happen? And what, is, what are these kinds of programs doing for them? And, and I think we, we're trying to figure out what do we need family to really have home-based programs? If individuals want home-based care, if we see they can benefit from it, how much family involvement are we assuming we need? What are we relying on the families for? Um, and these are sort of open questions that I'm currently working with. Um, so I don't, I don't have set answers um, necessarily. And then really thinking about what services should be provided for families uh, with home-based care. And, and we have examples of this from sort of models of hospice care, of course, and other home health programs. And we know there that, of course, the, they work with family very much. That's really a major part of it. Um, but we have to sort of put that um, at the forefront as we're developing these programs. They can't be developed without really thinking about the family's role. And I, I, I like to think that the home-based care programs um, should reduce burden uh, for families, not, not increase burden for families. And really, we, we, we can't sort of just be um, using this unpaid uh, lab a labor force, but really working with them um, and, and, and thinking about them as, as we're making these choices about the types of care we want to provide. So with that, I'll acknowledge um, funders, and thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine, and I'll ask the other panelists to join me upstage. I'm tempted to just put these questions up there <laughs> as, a, uh, as a starting point for our discussions. So as before, if um, you can go to the microphone to signal for our mic, we'd love to get this started. You should turn this thing on. Hi, I'm just curious, yes. what are some uh, things that are now can be treated in the home that maybe five, ten years ago 
Um, we are we are doing a lot in the home. I mean, we you know we have a lot of pneumonia cases that you could imagine we're treating. I mean, a lot of it is based on the is technology based sort of, and but not not even that. It's really just can we get the medications that we need? Can we get the systems in place? So ev every day we're tackling something new um, around how to do it. But a lot of it is really can we do infusion? How is this going to work? Like what what do we need to have in place there? Can we get it in a timely manner? So it's like coordinating with vendors is really it's not even necessarily the technological brilliance. You know, mm -hmm. sort of oh here's this great idea. It's like okay you have to move quickly with it. And so it's really thinking through a lot of that um, to do it. But we've expanded. Um, um, you know, to, you know, things that nobody thought. When we started this project, funded, you know, we had a list of like 10 things and it just, it kept growing. And even, you know, our rehab at home program, that's something that just grew naturally. Saying, you know what, we could do this. I wanted to ask about the role of training for caregivers and what do you think you've seen that has really worked and in particular, I was curious about training that's focused on empathy. So really being able to understand um, you know, whether it's someone with Alzheimer's or uh, even just someone whose physical capabilities are far different. You know, has empathy, have you seen great examples of empathy training working and making a difference? So <clears throat> that's very much a core of what we try. To accomplish in in our in the savvy caregiver, we do guided imagery. We do lots of group processing about the experience that the person who's living with the illness must have of an ever more confusing world. And and I think then the role of training is just as a clinician would step back <clears throat> and say, "What's going on here? What might cause this? What can I do?" How can I redu you know, help the person regain equilibrium? Mm -hmm. Now that, those, those two things kind of go together, understanding it and then having a technique. It's not enough to just understand. Right. You've got to be able to do something. Right. That's what I was curious about, so turning that into actionable. Yeah, we actually teach the nursing process. I mean, just. What's going on? What do I think I can do? Let me try it and let's see what happens. Are there comments or should I take more questions? Um, so I'm happy. I think one of, I think your question is a good one. Mm -hmm. And um, I think one of my reaction was, I think, reflective of some of the challenges in this area when um, I think when you posed the question uh, about empathy, I was wondering whether you were talking about training of the caregiver or training of the healthcare professional. <laughs> so, yes. so, so I, and, and I think in both cases mm -hmm. there's merit and um, importance. I think there are, uh, there's been a lot of work around trying to train the professional healthcare workforce for geriatric medicine. There are these GWEPs that the health, HRSA is a federal agency is, um, that is focused on trying to infuse geriatric competencies through the health professional workforce. Okay. Um, I think they're probably, I am not steeped in this, but I believe that a lot of the focus is more on technical skills as opposed to teaching empathy. Mm -hmm. um, but I think uh, it certainly is important, particularly within the context of um, cognitive impairment where there are specific challenges around communication and empathy is clearly critical. Great. Take some questions Thank from here. Thank you for an excellent panel. And um, you know, as the organizers, we asked you to focus on the kind of caregivers you focused on. Um, of course, there's also paid caregivers, direct care workers who help with bathing and dressing. As we um, face the, what some people call the ro robotocalypse, as, as, as people will be replaced from some jobs, it seems that there'll be a lot of room for uh, direct care of, of older adults. And I wonder if, how much do you think what you said applies to direct care workers who are paid versus not paid, and what we can, maybe how they can help. Uh, family caregivers, any 
I think that's a really important area to look at. Um, and I think especially as increasingly we, we see that uh, individuals, as I mentioned, don't necessarily have family. And they also may not have family who are able to help or they live long distances and we have to think about it. I think there's really hasn't been as much work around um, teaching paid caregivers and really thinking of them. You know, I think they're a lot of the research is really focused on sort of a workforce issue and not really focusing on them as, as part of the care team and thinking about how they work closely with families and how they work closely with clinicians and really on, are the you know, eyes and, and the ears. And you know, I know in, in our experience in home-based care, a lot of those paid caregivers, you know, they're, they're like family to our mm -hmm. patients and they are the ones that the, you know, our physicians call. <laughs> they know those people very well. So I think we really need to start bringing them more to the table. And, and that's actually a very difficult thing to do because um, they're often underpaid Undertrained, um, and there's often lack of continuity um, with that group, which I think is, is really problematic. So, uh, <clears throat> we have to take the family caregivers and say, We know you're doing this because of a relationship you have, but really, you've got to learn a role. I think what your question suggests you kind of know how to do the role. Maybe you need to develop some relationship, and maybe we have to provide ways, for, uh, entrees into that kind of relationship. Teach families to tell stories about the person so that they become a person for, uh, but I think in the, the system issues are so, so difficult. It really goes back to how do the, the more highly skilled and highly paid professionals learn to acknowledge the importance of what these people are bringing to the situation and really listen. Jennifer? Yeah, so I guess I'll just chime in. I agree with all of the comments that have been raised. I think that we have um, sort of systematically there's a lot that could be done to supporting both the unpaid sort of family workforce and the direct care workforce. And that often, as Catherine said, there's a blurring in terms of the intimacy that um, the direct care workforce brings in, in caring for individuals who are frail and vulnerable with incredibly um, intimate tasks um, and interacting with them on a regular basis. And that um, I think the current system issues often don't do um, adequately uh, elicit from individuals how they want to involve these important uh, direct and family caregivers in their care. So a lot of my work has focused more recently on um, engaging uh, families in communication through, for example, direct sort of simple scalable strategies such as um, uh, shared access to the patient portal. And we found that nearly all primary care patients with cognitive impairment want their families to have information access. And in the context of breast cancer, um, women in active treatment for breast cancer, three quarters of them want their families to have access to their health information, but a quarter don't. And, um, and very few sort of across the board, this is not, families don't have information access using their own identity credentials. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of variability, individual variability um, in populations, um, as well as, you know, within specific interpersonal relationships. And that often if individuals are living in the community, relying on a direct care worker, they may very much want that direct care worker to be able to access their information. And this is sort of just scratching, it's like the tip of the iceberg in terms of thinking about person-centered care. Um, you know, and, and sort of respecting the direct care workers and that they bring an enormous amount in helping individuals with disability get by on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and it's not just that what they're being paid for in terms of personal care assistance, it's also maybe assuming a role in the care coordination. Right. Yeah. Terrific. Okay. Terrific. Greg? So as we start getting to the spot, then, you know, talk about planning for the day for someone with uh, uh, cognitive, uh, cognitive issues that it, it's not a lot like what a doctor would do. You try to diagnose what's going on, you try to come up with a treatment plan, and then you try to monitor that plan and see if the plan is working. And so I started to think about what are some of the issues that come up in traditional healthcare when we start to build decision support systems? And really, it, 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 there's a spectrum, but you know, on one end of the spectrum, it's uh, in some 
consent, you're getting decision support that is essentially a black box that tells you to do something and you don't know why and you like to understand why it's telling you to do that. Uh, on the other end, it's uh, you know, something that's just popping up and telling you to do something and you just don't want to do it because it's, yeah. you know, it basically gets in the way of what you know is the right thing to do. So I'm wondering, you know, as we start thinking about building these sorts of innovations that support caregivers, what, what actually do they want? Do they actually want something telling them, here's the plan for the day, here's what you do? Do they want something that's more nuanced, that's actually giving them some insights into why this might be the right thing to do? And I assume you see the same thing in home health care as you start to bring that into the home, that caregivers are going to want to know why, why is this being done? And that's the, the question I always ask a doctor when I go to a doctor, I know why are you doing this? So we can talk a little bit about what, what do caregivers actually want to in the context of maybe building systems that, that support decisions uh, for treatment, both uh, informally and more. Who wants to go first? I, I think that's what we do, and I think that the answer is it varies immensely. Um, there are a lot of caregivers who are pretty happy just to know Give me some, help me to develop some strategies. Don't give me the strategies, but help me to develop. And then there are others who are, you know, really kind of scholarly in, in their, what, what's going on and how can I understand it? So I think you have to read the, read the individuals. I think it varies enormously. But we, you know, want to provide that capacity if it's, if it's asked for. So we give a little bit of information. If they want more, we can give more. But. I'd say a really important point about that is that it really changes over time. And so I think that just adds a level of complexity to this in terms of what someone's involvement is at some point. It, it will change as an individual declines, as they, you know, as they sort of near death and, or as their functional um, needs um, increase. So I think that's hard because you kind of have to keep reassessing that in terms of what, and, and part of that is the, the involvement of families change over time too. So, you know, a daughter whose a name is good to know just in case someone misses an appointment, you know, and, th and at that stage, that's good that there's a contact, but later on, that their needs really, really change. Um, and I'd say it's also doesn't always match what the person wants and what the caregivers want. <laughs> and that really does get difficult. Um, a lot of times the, the caregiver may be um, easier to communicate with, right? And you, know, you can just, you know, but that's not what the patient wants. Um, and so that, that really, you know, it does add a layer of complexity around the family dynamics. And with that, I would say, you know, it's nice to have that, that one contact person, but it just sometimes there is a family and there is a, you know, complex dynamic around that family and you do have to, you know, recognize that they don't always agree on the, on the care plan. So that's sort of the, the hard part of that. <laughs> Russ, last question? Yeah. Uh, Second to last question? <laughs> Just under the wire. No, you're good. You're good. Whatever. Uh, you know, uh, listening to this panel and one in the morning, one of the things that comes through very, very strongly is the social and societal element of, of all of these problems. Um, now, as engineers, uh, oh, we're often to understand is how can technology or invention or development help us with that social role? I, I mean, I, I think Greg's question was perhaps a, an example of, for people with dementia, one of the things that I would have thought would be a useful technical tool is some of these computer-based activities that could themselves adapt to how well a person is responding. I mean, my mother died of Alzheimer's and I've seen that. But uh, could you all talk about other places where you think maybe technology, whether it's computer-based or physical-based or whatever, could help you, uh, for instance, in, in things like handover between caregivers or, or other ways of physical assist to the caregivers? Uh, I, I, we can't, by ourselves, solve society's problems, but perhaps we can help some 
question. We're, we're nearing the holidays. What is your holiday wish list? <laughs> so I think there, there, technology has enormous potential to uh, improve the ability of society to meet the challenging, uh, age-related challenges um, of the growing older adult population. And I think that um, technology, often family, we, there was slides earlier today, there was talk about the digital divide, and it is, it is it, for sure, there is um, our pockets of the population that are less able to access and use technology, and, that, and I think for that segment of the population, families often bridge the divide and are able to better access and leverage the available technology. So it's, um, you know, again, I think that tech, there are sort of endless opportunities in terms of the ability of sort of autonomous vehicles to help with transportation that, um, you know, may give older adults greater independence and also reduce caregiving related challenges so that working caregivers don't have to take off a day of work or half a day to make sure that their family member makes medical appointments. Um, there are uh, potential uh, ways to develop technologies to facilitate shared housing. Uh, you know, it's, I think it's um, that families and that all of these technologies that may be oriented around individuals potentially have spillover effects for families. So I think it's difficult to think about teasing the two apart um, and that there are a lot, there's sort of endless ways to think about how technology can reduce um, the challenges of chronic uh, disease and disability. Um, I, I agree with that, and I think um, I, Some specific specific. <laughs> well, I think one of the things that um, we've talked about is really trying to better understand sort of a lot of the care activities that are happening for a patient and sort of, you know, knowing that, you know, for the caregiver, knowing that, okay, the nurse was in today. Because a lot of times, uh, especially in, as, as individuals are, are very ill, um, they have a lot of people coming by and they don't know who they are. They don't know that this is the doctor or this is the, you know, they just, there's just, that's happening and they can't convey that very well necessarily. We've talked a lot about having a system for really tracking who's there, who's, and this, this you can imagine in the hospital too, right? Not just, you know, in the home necessarily, but like, who are these people? How do I contact them? What did they do? Like someone saw my mother, who was that? Um, and really trying to understand um, the names of these people, what their occupations are, you know, and sort of to really kind of follow that and, and to know who to contact to see how, um, a parent is doing and to understand that. I would say in the home-based world, there's a lot of monitoring technologies for, for patients that have really helped us to advance the field and we're still working to do to get real-time information that would then trigger a visit to say there's been a change here. Um, but a lot of it um, involves make, having the patients and the families feel comfortable with that because it's you know a little mm -hmm. scary to yep. be left alone that way. So that's that's where mm -hmm. we're working now. But there's a lot of um, there's a lot of exciting new things happening there. So I'll give you three problems you need to solve. <laughs> okay, one is family conflict. <laughs> family conflict. Um, Good luck. Daughter doesn't believe that the father has this illness, and the son thinks that the mother is not doing a good job. And they live in San Francisco and New York. Okay, that's one problem. The second is the friends don't visit and they've stopped and the, and the couple has stopped going to service, to religious services. Mm -hmm. The third and biggest, uh, the guy has fallen, broken a hip, and has gone into the hospital. Um, lights flash, anesthesia is given, people probe and, and prod, and he's expected to go home in three and a half days and the wife is going <clears> to <throat> reestablish the rather tenuous equilibrium that had been in place before hospitalization. So move them effectively through that. Solve any of those problems, and I think uh, a, lot, a lot would be helped. <laughs> you might want to put family conflict last on the list, but um, <laughs> <laughs> just from the, my experience. <laughs> it's on the day of the week. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Question. Um, I'm looking to our last questioner because yeah. um, I, oh, there they are. Are they pulling this or not? One more question, please. Um, 
I also think that at least two other hurdles to uh, the development of new innovative solutions that improve care for older adults and improve the, or reduce the burden for caregivers is really sorting out uh, reimbursement payments. Yeah. I know there's funding for pilots and trials and all that. Real, and I know that the shift from fee for service to paying for outcomes eventually is going to help, but it's taking too long and it's discouraging a lot of people who would otherwise jump in and try to develop things. And that requires collaboration between researchers, clinicians, engineers, programmers, coders, marketers, investors. People are scared away. And then also bring what are the right measures of success. I mean, they talk about the quadruple aims of healthcare innovation, which includes improving the burden on the healthcare provider, as well as outcomes and quality of care and quality of life and cost. But it seems like nobody's agreed, like, if you achieve this outcome, you will be paid by the system, not just by this one hospital. So are you optimistic that's going to get better? Because until it does, you're going to have a lot of really narrowly focused failed Talking about under the current administration or right. no. in the future? How do we make this sustainable that we get out of the pilot? So like with the Mount Sinai, you're, you're, yeah. how, how close are you there? Oh, it's, it's so challenging. <laughs> um, and it's, it's not easy, um, but it just requires being really creative and taking a lot of different approaches. I mean, right now we're really working with the Medicare Advantage programs and we're partnering with um, really smart people who have other programs in different places and building, you know, sort of joint ventures on working and we're going health, you know, uh, insurance program by insurance program and partnering them and showing, you know, partnering with them, showing them our outcomes. Would it be a lot easier if we could move through Medicare fee for service? Yeah, um, but well, you know, it's, it's, you can, we, so we're, I think the trick, what we're finding is we have to have, you can't just have one approach. You have to sort of create it and sort of try to get at it in a few different ways. Um, but, you know, the, the research evidence base has really been critical in the process. Mm -hmm. So we, we really take that very seriously because in the end, they're just like, show us, what are, what are you showing? And really seeing those benefits is, is the only thing. But it's, it's very challenging. Um, and, um, but I think we, we're still, feel optimistic in our in our in our fight and where we're going with it so I guess I'll, I'll agree that um, it's challenging but I also think that there that the landscape is changing in some ways that are very favorable and conducive to making the case that doing the right thing is also sort of a, a um, there's a business case for it mm -hmm. um, and I think this includes changes at CMS that are moving towards more flexible payments and paying for value and population-based health um, there are also um, there have been changes new reimbursement codes from dementia for example that include um, new care delivery payments that it, um, that where family and engaging family is part of uh, part of that and then also I think NIH, the, 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 a lot of the funders are now paying not just for efficacy trials, but for effectiveness trials that are sort of more pragmatic where the idea is to build the evidence that's needed by stakeholders to actually diffuse the intervention at the, at the end of the day. So I think that also is encouraging in allowing the scientific community to come together with the stakeholders who are um, sort of poised to be able to diffuse these interventions more broadly. So I, I think that there is sort of some promise. All right, I'm going to grab that upswing uh, of optimism <laughs> and thank our panel. We're going to stay put in here, our instructions for the lunch break, um, but I want to thank our three experts. You guys have been great.